thank you. You fuckers came on a good night. <laughs> Holy shitballs. The stuff that is going on. I'm wearing a Kevlar vest for safety, as well as Kevlar panties. So none of you mafia motherfuckers just shoot me during this act. Because we will be talking some shit about the housewives of New Jersey tonight. Can you handle it? I knew that you could. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. And as a matter of fact, I'm recording my new CD right here, right now. So thank you especially for coming tonight, New Jersey, recording the CD. And um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you. I agree, sir. Now, I assume that was a drag queen. I'm sorry. Now look. All right. Um, you know, last year I recorded a CD. Number one, because I'm an artist who cares about people. Mostly the children, when you think about it. Isn't it really about them? All right, anyway, and also... And I got nominated for a Grammy. It didn't quite go my way. But tonight, I'm recording <clears throat> a holiday CD. That's right. Tonight, you are here for the special recording of Kathy Griffin's Sucking It for the Holidays. Try not to well up. I know it's a very touching and emotional title, and I hope you all sit around with your families and celebrate a lot of dick jokes for Kwanzaa and Navidad and Christmas and all those other holidays, because the CD after that joke will have nothing to do with the holidays at all. So happy Kwanzaa, everybody. Let's make this the best Kwanzaa ever. All right, now look, we have so much to cover tonight. First of all, none of you brought your fucking kids, right? Like, can we just take care of that shit right now? I do not care about your children. Um, yeah, that's right. I said it right to your face. Yeah, that's right, Jersey. I'm sorry. I meant your kids are gifted. They're all gifted. Special gifted. Now, I, can't, I love it when I play a casino and then I'm halfway through my pussy material and someone has the nerve to be like, hey, there's children here. We'll take them the fuck home. They don't belong here. All right? It's mommy and daddy night or daddy and daddy night, whichever. I don't, yes. Hello, gays. Hello, gays. Oh, you're here. Thank God. I was a nervous wreck. Hello, ladies and lesbians. Hello, four straight guys. Where are my four straight guys? I know you're bitter straight guys. I know, I understand. All right, so let me just say this to the four straight guys who are here. Tonight, for you coming to my show, it's going to be kind of like being molested. You're going to have to go to a safe place. Um, I got nothing for you. You know how when you're getting molested and... You know what I mean? You know the priest is here, and then you get molested, and you know, you had a nice dinner, and then it's time for the molestation. And you have to just go to a safe place, maybe a hammock in Hawaii, whatever that safe place is for you four straight guys. Go there. Go there right now. I got nothing for you. Relax. Have another drink. Have several. And to the, la the ladies who brought them, you owe them a serious blowjob later. A very, <laughs> right, a serious, committed blowjob some ball tickling and some swallowing. That's right. It's going to be that kind of night. Sorry. I apologize. I know. Sorry. And I'm going long tonight, buddy, because I got a lot of material for this fucking holiday CD. No, did you know that in a casino, you're cont contractually bound not to go too long because they get mad because they want you back at the tables? So there's like some fucking Vinny, you know, waiting for me <laughs> with like a threatening look in his eye with his cousin. Are you guys all cousins in New Jersey? Are you cousins or like cousins with a wink? All right, so, and believe me, we'll get to the housewives and we're going to get to every fucking city of the housewives. We're not just going to stop at New Jersey. We have so much breaking news tonight. Do you know who marched at a giant Prop 8 rally 
in California for you gays. Your very own 89-year-old activist, my mother Maggie Griffin. Yes, marching for gay marriage. 89 years old, she's got your back. All right, her first march since Prohibition. Um, she was, she, she's the best. She had the best sign. There were all these celebrities there, Drew Barrymore and everything. My mom had the best sign. It said, gay marriage, I'll drink to that. I swear to God. Come on, that's some funny shit. Um, no, no, even when my mom was willing to march for Prop 8, I thought that was so funny, because you know my mom secretly, not secretly, but I'm embarrassed, she loves Fox News, loves Bill O'Reilly, all that stuff. And I said, Mom, you know, why are you in favor of gay marriage? That's a pretty liberal notion. And she goes, oh, for Christ's sake, Kathleen, in this economy, can you imagine the money that gays are going to spend on those goddamn weddings? It's good for the whole country. I know. She's your best activist. All right, so, so sure enough, because I'm on the road so much, which I love, I do worry about my mom. And so, you know, I got her this woman, Bernice, who comes in every night, and she doesn't really do anything, except she does, she might pour a glass of wine now and again. And she basically just stares at my mom's hip. Because you know how old people are obsessed with breaking their hip? I could break a hip, Kathleen. My sister Anne fell and she broke her hip and it shattered into 74 pieces. And so there's part of the rug coming up and you gotta tape it down with some scotch tape because I could break a goddamn hip on that part of the rug. And I got two for one at the 99 cent store of scotch tape. So you need to, okay, so it's all about the hip. It's like swimsuit models are about the hips. My mother's all about the hip. So Bernice comes over every night and just pours my mom wine and watches her fucking hip. Anyway. So I said to her, I said, you know, Mom, um, it's great that Bernie comes in at night, but maybe, maybe I should get you another nurse to come in two or three days a week and just kind of keep an eye on you, maybe heat up some soup, go to the store for you, something like that. What do you think? And then she said, I'm just, okay, I've done the disclaimers. I'm just going to, I'm going to give you the quote. The last thing I need is a Polak going through my goddamn underwear drawer. <laughs> All right, now, first of all, you, you guys made her a star. Now you have to live with her, okay? I blame you, you're responsible as well. All right, let's break it down. First of all, when's the last time you even heard the word Pollock? Um, is Mannix on in the next room? Is Ironsides gonna wheel in and solve a crime? Is that what's gonna happen next? Uh, second of all, there are no Polish people in the entire state of California. Really, she doesn't need to worry. Third of all, who the fuck wants to go through her goddamn underwear drawer? I couldn't pay a Polak to go through her goddamn underwear drawer. To see what? Her stretched out girdle from the Sears and Roebuck catalog, 1972? And don't you feel at that age, they're so playing the age card, right? Like, she had this little twinkle in her eye when she said it, like she's being my defiant teenage daughter. I said, mother, what is the matter with you using that language? What the hell is the matter with you? And then I could tell she had this little half smile. Why would I say what I do? What happened? Did I say something real un-PC? I said, yes, mother, you know you did. Don't give me that crap. You're not supposed to say poor. What's the matter with you? What happened, Ma? Come on. What'd I say? You know what you said. Shame on you using that word. And then she said, as if this would make it better, well, how about a sturdy German? <laughs> a sturdy German. I said, Mother, uh, how do you propose I buy you a sturdy German, whatever the fuck that means? <laughs> Don't you remember the Schumachers down the block? Yes, Mother. What if we had, like, the Schumachers? That woman was on her hands and knees cleaning the sidewalk with a brush. Mother, you could eat off the sidewalk. No, we are not getting you a sturdy German. Why? Because 
It's illegal, first of all. I'm not gonna call a nursing agency and request a sturdy German, <laughs> your honor. No, it's not legal. So then she says, why didn't you call the agency and ask if there's someone there who can bake a strudel? I'm not kidding. I'm not, may God strike me dead if I'm making this up. This is a typical conversation with Maggie Griffin. It's embarrassing. So anyway, if any of you guys know a sturdy German, you know, Twitter me or something. Twat me, start some twatting, I don't know. All right, I gotta tell you one more thing about my mom, and she's gonna, I'm, I'm looking like she's here. She's in LA, but anyway, I'm, I don't fly anymore, it's stressful. It's too stressful. All right, so it's true, my mom won't get on an airplane anymore, but um, <clears throat> not that I wanna ship her anywhere, but <laughs> where she can quietly live in a straitjacket, but, uh, but no, 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 I, are you kidding? Where would the show be without her? I know, that, I, know, I know I'm the sidekick on my own show. Don't think I'm not aware of that. By the way, don't be fooled, my mom is fine. There's nothing wrong with her. That walker is fake. She doesn't need it. No, it's to manipulate you. She doesn't need a walker. She's fine. Do you know why? Because the walker has the fanny pack in front. Yeah, for her wine, okay? Which she calls her wine to survive. Like she's a celebrity, get her out of here, right? Her wine to survive. Okay, so I'm surprised that she doesn't fall just because her walker is so top heavy with the fucking box of wine. I'm surprised she hasn't fallen on her own box of wine. But um, you know that right now, if we were going to do the split screen, here we are. And then somewhere in California on a balcony is my mother with the box of wine. <laughs> with her Filipino nurse, Bernice, tipping the box. Now, come on. Don't stop it. Stop it. Shame on you. Cheering for my mother, draining a box of Franzia. Kathleen, stop saying I drink out of a goddamn box. Sometimes I, I take a funnel and I put the two buck chuck in a funnel in a bottle for your information. God damn it, real smart ass. Christ's sake. Why couldn't you have been a dental hygienist like we wanted? God damn it, agitating poor Oprah for Christ's sake. And that poor, nice Gail, the two of them seem like a real nice couple. <laughs> All right, so in addition to the wine, my mother has now talked one of her doctors into giving her, and she was so proud of herself, what she calls nervous pills. <laughs> oh, yes. So she comes home one day, Kathleen, guess what? I got the doctor to give me some nervous pills. <laughs> like, they're called nervous pills. Like, there's a fucking bottle with three X's and a skull and crossbones on it. I said, Mom, what's the real name of the pill? They're not called nervous pills. How the hell am I supposed to know? I can't read that goddamn label. It's so tiny with all those goddamn letters. I don't know what the Christ it is. Let me enjoy myself for once. God damn it. You're the reason I need my goddamn nervous pill in the first place. Son of a bitch. Look at me, I'm a wreck. Because of you and your goddamn questions. All right, so... Have you noticed, though, at that age, the old people are all about the fractions? Like, they're all about dividing? The other day, Kathleen, I'm watching my Judge Judy, and I'm telling you, there was a case that was so intense, I had to take a fifth of a nervous pill. <laughs> Did you see Lou Dobbs? Our borders are broken. I gotta take a ninth of a nervous pill. <laughs> so, yeah, right now, somewhere. And by the way, she doesn't realize that by the end of the day, it racks up to a whole nervous pill. Believe me. <laughs> She's doing the math in her head, just like we all are. My mother's like Courtney Love at this point, I swear to God. <laughs> Courtney Love, living in my house. 89, fuck it, have three nervous pills, what do I give a shit? Right, take the edge off, Maggie. All right, so, all right, so sure enough, I, uh, I got an award the other night. It was called a Gracie Award, and it was a woman's award, and it was about women, and women celebrating women, and... It was all about the pussy. Okay, so I was very excited to get an award, but what I didn't know was that it was gonna be such a star-studded event, right? So I go and like Mariska Hargitay is there and um, Katie Couric is there, who's fucking scary. She's like the white Oprah and she's, 
she's little, but she's scrappy like those midgets on Little People Big World where, like, she'll fucking box you and kick your ass and you don't know why. And she could, like, lift a car if someone was ever coming after one of her kids. Like, she's one of those. Um, I'm scared of her. In fact, at this award show, it was one of those award shows where if you talk too long, the band starts to play you off. And they did that to every single celebrity there except Katie Couric. Exactly, because she'll kill you. She'll fucking cut a bitch. All right, so I know people are scared of her. I dig it. And I think she's banging a guy 20 years younger than her, which I enjoy. I'm all for it. Good for her. And yet, at the same time, have you noticed Katie is now working the lesbian haircut? And she's more vicious than ever with that haircut. And she will take down the world with the lesbian haircut. So she's got the mindset of a fucking lesbian, the punch of a little person, and apparently the pussy of a 20-year-old. All right, so... That's what she's worked for decades in the news industry for someone to think that of her. Okay, sorry. So it was kind of a star set of thing, and I was really excited. So... I hope you're impressed, but the person I got to give me my own award, who was also being honored that night, and who was my date, lesbians, prick up your ears, my date was none other than out lesbian and financial icon, Susie Orman. Now let let me tell you something about Susie Orman. There is nothing that woman cannot do, nothing. And while I love President Obama, I think what we really need is a good, financially focused lesbian in the White House. All right? Susie Orman, 2012. Let me tell you something. You get a good, focused money dyke in there, and there is nothing she cannot do. She will move into that White House, caulk the tub, flip it, and sell it to the Chinese for a profit. Nothing a good, financially focused lesbian can't do. I love her i think she's so smart i was so thrilled to go with her and um by the way we shared a car to save money because that's how we do i um i actually brought her a month of my financials in the car i know so tacky and she fucking looked at them and read them over the whole way there yes all right so sure enough i'm doing the red carpet having a great time trying to start a rumor that Susie orman and i are lesbian lovers so that can only help my career of course and, you know, she doesn't give a shit, and so she's sort of going along with it and stuff. And so, she, you know, she's out, and she's had her girlfriend for many years and all this stuff. So sure enough, it comes time to go inside the award show, and we're running a little bit late, and so there weren't that many people about to go in. So we're walking in, and then Mariska Hargitay and her husband were behind us, and then in front of us is Gail King. Well, you know, Susie, she kind of knows I talk shit about people, but she doesn't really know who, and... She doesn't, she just doesn't give a shit, you know? And so she, of course, is on the Oprah show all the time, and I'm sure she spent a lot of time with Oprah and her boyfriend, Gail, and, you know, I think those two guys are terrific, what they do together, and they've built an empire, and we're going to overturn that Prop 8 in California. I really mean it. And we walk up to Gail. We're feet away from Gail, and then Susie very innocently says, because, you know, she can't be anyone but who she is, and, of course, she knows Oprah and Gail very well, and she says, oh, look, there's Gail. And before I can sort of stop her, like, hey, let's hurry in a different doorway, um, she says, hey, hi, Gail. What's going on, girlfriend? How you doing, girlfriend? Gail King, Kathy Griffin, Kathy Griffin, Gail King. So I, you know, thought of all the shit I've talked about <laughs> Oprah and Gail over the years, flashing before me in a tunnel of death, and just looked at Gail and said, hi, it's so uncomfortable to meet you. And then Gail said, oh, well, I've heard some of the things you've said about me, and you're very snarky. (laughs) Busted. Busted. And what am I going to do? Deny it? Um, So I just went, yes. (laughs) When you're busted, you're busted. What am I, you know what I mean? I can't take it back. So I said, well, you know, um, yeah, I'm trying to be like Dorothy Parker, but, you know, bitchier. Um, Because the word snarky reminds me of Dorothy Parker. And um, I said, well, I hope you take it in the spirit in which it's intended. And then she goes, well, yes, you're very snarky. (laughs) And I just went, right. 
And she goes, well, I'll be at the next table. And I said, it'll be a nightmare. Um, <laughs> all right, so I have to tell you this. The first person to come out, and like I said, this award show was like sort of a bigger deal than I thought it would be. So Nisi's hosting, and she's great. And then the first honoree comes out, and it is Dr. Maya Angelo. That's right, American treasure, Dr. Maya Angelo. Okay, I know I'm going against the grain. But I'm just going to say it. Dr. Maya Angelo is insufferable. She is awful. There, I said it. I'm sorry. I know she's a genius. I know she is a Nobel laureate. I get it. She is insufferable. She comes out, and we all have to stand, and half the women there are wiping away their tears to be in her presence, and I'm pinching myself, trying to make myself cry, and clapping, clapping, clapping. I get it. I admire her. I respect her, and she's awful. They are not mutually exclusive. She comes out, and the, the cadence drives me insane. It takes her 17 minutes to say one fucking sentence. She makes no sense. She makes not one lick of sense. I don't care how many poems. You know what I learned? I learned why the caged bird sings. <laughs> to drown out her horrible voice. There. I'm sorry, America. I know she's all up in the Clinton shit. I get it. But you know when she's talking that smack, you know Bill is just going off to fucking porn in his head trying to get through it. Not a lick of sense. There is a tablecloth. It is a cloth on top of a table. There are bottles of water. Water encased in bottlery. Including water in its soul. Tablecloth. What? Wrap it up, bitch. Let's go. Come on, honey. It went on and on. So, and then of course, every celebrity after her had to go up and go, I just can't believe I'm on the same stage as Dr. Michelangelo. I was like, ugh, I can't either. Um, I mean, I can't either. Uh, not a popular sentiment. Dr. Maya Angelou is horrible. All right, so... Oh, I have to tell you this one thing that I don't think is going to make it to the D-list show, so I just want to tell you because it was really funny, but I don't think he'll ever sign the release. All right, so one thing that I do is the theme of the season is that I have these A-listers trying to, you know, mentor me and give me tips on getting on the A-list. So we do this one episode with rapper T.I. You know who this guy is? He's exactly. He's hugely famous. And when I went, when I got to go to the Grammys, like everybody was making a big fuss over him. And he has that song. No one on the corner has swaka laka, swaka swaka laka. So he's that guy. You can have whatever but you won't. All right, so he's, he's a really fascinating guy, and, you know, I had to get him while I could because he's on a little time schedule. <laughs> he's, you know, currently um, on a sojourn, let's just put it that way, a government-mandated type of a hiatus. Let's call it that in a state-run, actually federally-run facility <laughs> because he enjoys the machine guns and accidentally might have rubbed off some serial numbers. You know, it's a long story. Um, and he's a very interesting guy. You know, uh, you know he's like the block to mom. He's got eight kids. And... I, I still, I can't get enough of that Octomom. I can't help it. I just... I like how they're like, she's in negotiations for a reality show. I'm like, what the fuck? It, what do you think it is now? Do they follow her? She's like fucking Britney Spears going to Starbucks seven times a day with her Chanel knockoff glasses and her fucking Starbucks. And, um... I like, by the way, I like how she's trying to fucking fool me about not having her lips done. Like, you're gonna fool me on that shit? It looks like a pussy's on her face. <laughs> It could be hers, it could be someone else's. I've twatted about it. So, all right, so anyway, sure enough, 
I get rapper T.I. to do the, the uh, dealer show, you know, while I can, on a deadline. And uh, there's a segment on the show where every week I have my celebrity guests do a segment called Will You Take My Call? And I have them call a celebrity that I know would never take my call in a million years, which is pretty much everyone except my mom. Um, <laughs> So we're sitting there with T.I., and you know, his fans are like crazed fans and all this stuff, and we're sitting there in L.A. at a restaurant, Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, because, right? Because black people think that chicken go with waffles, uh, and they're right. So, um, so, so anyway, I'm sitting there with T.I. at Roscoe's, and then I try to be really casual about it, and I go, hey, um, let's call Justin Timberlake. And he's like, all right. So he takes up, I know. And remember, we're wearing microphones and the cameras on there and everything. And I go, hey, um, why don't you put it on speaker? So he does. All right, now, all right, so he calls JT. And here's the thing. Think about it. If you get a call from TI, you're going to take it. Because time is of the essence. And <laughs> you better pick up. Because next time he calls, there might be like a government official in between that's prefacing. All right, so sure enough. Justin picks up immediately. Now, you know, one of my obsessions is Wiggas, the white people who think that they're black. And I know where I am. I see you, Jersey. I see you with your Kangol hat. I see you. I know where I am. Stop! All right. You saw I was in the video with Eminem, the ultimate Wigga, right? So, so sure enough, here's T.I. calling Justin Timberlake. And you know Justin Timberlake doesn't just think he's African-American. He thinks he is a dark-skinned brother from a tribe in the Congo with a bone in his nose. He, yes. Yes. Um, his pubic hair is dreads. I mean, really. No, come on. He's dark-skinned brother. So it's on speaker, and Tia calls Justin. And you guys, the conversation was so hilarious. I'm sure it'll never make the show. But Justin was, like, out-blacking T.I., and as the call went on, they were like getting blacker and blacker to the point where I couldn't even understand what Justin was saying. He wasn't even saying words. He was just making these guttural sounds. So it was Tiago like, what's up? What's up, Blair? How you doing? All right, Pip. What's up? Hey, holla. All right, then. You should call me. You should call me, too. What's up? Then? How you doing? All right, then. That's uh, uh-huh. And by the end, I was just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh, hey, ha, uh ooh, ah, like that. Just vowels. And they kept calling each other player, and they were each pimping, and it was hysterical until the moment when Justin says, what you doing, player? And then T.I. goes, I'm just hanging here with the Kathy Griffin doing her show. And then Justin turned white again in the blink of an eye and goes, oh. <laughs> and rushed off the phone. And T.I. hung up and he started laughing. He goes, that was embarrassing. I go, yeah, he's your friend. Um, <laughs> all right, so I went, oh, did you guys watch The Celebrity Apprentice? That was a pisser. Okay, so get this. I have some behind-the-scenes shit because, you know, I was part of the final challenge with Joan Rivers. All right, so get this. So I, um, you know, not a big fan of Trump. think he's a fucking tool. And um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. think he's a tool. Not sure how honest he is about the finances, think he's a blowhard, all that stuff. But I will tell you, I kind of feel bad for that Melania. You know what I mean? She's just barely gotten out of Romania, and now look at her future. And, um, sorry, I just pictured her blowing him. Hold on. Hold my hair. Woo! Okay, sorry. Uh, that's a tough one. So... So anyway, but you know, I'm pals with Joan Rivers and I dig her and I know, you know, people are hard on her about her face work and all that, but I, I think she's fucking badass ghetto. I really do. I mean, at 75 years old to win that show and to be put through all that shit and to run that gauntlet. And you know, I love people like that. I love her. I love Howard Stern. I love the troublemakers and I love the people that, you know, are fearless and Bill Maher and all that stuff. So, so anyway, um, I was of course rooting for Joan and I was in New York a few months ago and then her office called and said, you know, Joan's doing this 
the Celebrity Apprentice, and you know, would you show up for this one challenge? And I said, how much? Because I knew it would be a donation thing. I've seen the show. So I said, of course. So I show up, and then, and this was hard for me to keep a lid on, because I knew a long time ago that the final two were Joan Rivers and Annie Duke. And so they said, you know, I signed a thing saying I wouldn't tell anybody and all that stuff. And so, um, so I show up, and it's, one of the, it's a donation challenge, and she's got her charity and all that stuff. But I said to her, okay, what can I do to help? Is there anything I can do to help you win? Because I really, really want you to win. I think it's pretty amazing. And I said, what do I do when Trump shows up? And, you know, and she just said, just make a big fuss over him. But I, I mean, the shit that she said on that show to Annie Duke, I mean, right? It's a poker player, a poker player. I know your people, they don't have last names. I mean, it's shit that like a handful of people in the world can get away with saying. I love it. It's what I call the Rickles license to kill. You know, Rickles can say things that nobody else can get away with. A poker player. Oh, I loved it. All right, so anyway, so I show up, and, and she said, just make a big fuss over Trump when he shows up. And I was like, Blech. Oh, okay. So, so the challenge is going along, and then in comes the Donald, and then the son, and I guess we're trying to play some game here where we act like he's a successful tycoon with his fucking slick back hair and his hooker wife. I mean dancer. Um, okay, so... I thought, you know, maybe Trump would be a tool or be the real story and he shows up in his fucking trench coat mafia look or whatever the fuck that is with the insane comb over and the crazy eyebrows that are some sort of pubic wig gone wrong. I don't know his story. I don't get his gig. But no, guess who turns out to be the real story? Ivanka. The daughter, Ivanka. All right. So she's the one where I guess we're playing this game where we're supposed to act like she's a really hardcore, serious businesswoman and she could have been a model, but instead, you know, she's got a head for business and a bod for sin. No, she's got a head for nothing and a bod for sale. And I'm sorry, but I'm supposed to act like this girl is like a fucking, you know, can run a company? Please, this is a girl who's got the fake boobies and she's where she is because of her dad. She works for her dad. She works with her dad, et cetera, et cetera. So she comes in and she truly is Amazonian. She's giant. She's really, really tall. The boobies are out to here and she's just a big hardcore lady, you know? So, so they all come in together and I'm, you know, say hi to Trump and then the son. And then I wasn't even really thinking about Ivanka. And I just went up to her and I'm, you know, I want Joan to win so bad. And I just smiled and said, hi, my name's Kathy Griffin. Nice to meet you. And then Ivanka reaches out. And for some reason, this girl who's like, what, fucking 27 or whatever, starts to shake my hand and does some crazy bullshit really hard hand squeeze like some fucking Tony Robbins, Dale Carnegie, dominatrix shit that she learned at a seminar somewhere her dad gave through the learning annex. And I'm just like, I don't know what came over me, but I remember just thinking for a second, like, what the fuck? Not on my watch, bitch. I squeezed her hand as hard as I could with all my might. I wanted to break a bone. I don't know what she was thinking, but I know what I was thinking, and it was not today. And the whole time, I mean, she must think I'm a lunatic, because the whole time, I'm squeezing her hand as hard as I can, and I'm smiling and acting like I'm so famous, I have to start talking to someone else, and I refuse to let go of her hand. So I'm going, nice to meet you. Isn't Charity wonderful? Joan is doing such amazing work for God's love we deliver. I really hope she goes the distance because she's so fabulous. And I could tell Ivanka was like, oh, oh take the crazy lady away. And then I, fi <laughs> I finally released her head and I know she fucking thought I was insane, but I just thought that was like the weirdest move. Um, are you ready? Because we're going to start breaking down the real housewives of New York City. Oh, yes. All right. So let's walk through the cities. Straight guys, good night. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. So... 
let's go ahead and start with OC. So the Real Housewives of OC started out as an inexpensive way to rip off Desperate Housewives. There you go. Bravo. Shout out. Okay. Shout out to you, Bravo. So, uh, so anyway, they, they were kind of boring. You know, I got to admit, I don't get these shows. I don't get these bitches that don't work and don't do anything. I don't know what the fuck they do in OC. They all live in that fucked up cul-de-sac together with matching granite. There's like one granite in the entire county of Orange County. They all have that one granite. You know, they get fucking mani-pedis. Uh, uh, fine. But all these women that don't work, I, I sort of get it, but aren't you bored by like 11? You know, enough already. So sure enough, The Real Housewives of OC was chugging along, but it's a little boring until this year, and they really kicked it up a notch with Gretchen, the new hot, sexy blonde on the OC, who, um, I think she killed her husband. I'm just going to say it. I'm sorry. But there's a character on The Real Housewives of OC who started out with this, like, Kenny Rogers-looking older sugar daddy who's just dead now. I'm sorry, but I think she might have killed him. I think they're just killing people now on The Real Housewives franchise. I'm not kidding. Because he started out, he wasn't feeling well. Next thing you know, he's dead. And then there's a scene where she's with his children in a sexy little skimpy outfit and showing off a giant diamond ring that he bought her before he died, going, look how big it is, look how big it is. He's dead, I just want FYI. And I'd like an investigation, not like the, you like how they keep saying that in Jersey? I'm gonna do some investigating. I thought it was get to know. You know, like in real life, you might get to know your friends. In Jersey, you fuckers investigate. Some investigating. All right, we're getting there. I'm fucking, believe me, I'm working up to Jersey. I'm working up. It's a journey. It is a journey. We're on the tri-state. We're almost there. So, all right, so Gretchen, by the way, um, I don't know if you know this, but do you know who she's now dating in real life? Slade from the breakup with Joe and Slade. Yes, that's her real boyfriend, that man whore, Slade, who I get crabs just thinking about him. <laughs> I think the word Slade and I'm fucking itching like this and I'm brushing the crabs off my peach. I am, I'm brushing them off. I'm sorry, I gotta go get that salve now and make it all go bye-bye and say I got it from a dorm bed. All right. But really I got it from thinking of Slade. So, all right, so there's the OC. So then we go to the Real Housewives of New York City. Now once again, I know, I know. Those girls, you know, ratcheted things up another notch. I gotta tell you, there's so many fascinating characters on that show. But this year, they added a particularly crazy bitch, Kelly Kilgore and Benzino. Now, this bitch be crazy, crazy, in the most awesome way. Now, first of all, she used to be married to a famous photographer called Gilles Benzino. Now, the only reason I know who Gilles Ben Simone is is from watching Tyra Banks on America's Next Top Model. That's the only way I've heard of this guy looking at Tyra week after week saying, congratulations, you are one step further to becoming America's Next Top Model. Among the prizes, a photography session with famed photographer Gilles Ben Simone. So that's the only way I know who this guy is. So when I heard the name Kelly Ben Simone, I thought, okay, there's his clearly ex-wife. And, and then I finally saw a picture of Gilles Ben Simone. And of course, he's, you know, this French old fart that married a, you know, a teen model back in the day. And boy, did he get a little more than he bargained for with her, right? That's right. So now he's, I don't know who he's banging now, but he's, you know, in his early hundreds. Um, in a way, he kind of reminds me René Ogilil. That is right. The husband of Canadian songbird Sally and Dion. Bonjour, ça va? Je t'aime. Je suis Sally and Dion. Who is married to René Ogilil. And they have a son. He's the most beautiful person in my life. He's my son. He makes it all worth live. Every day I wake up and we make les oeufs avec fromage. And I go in, I have the play with little one angels. All right, so, so he's one of those dudes. And 
and she was married to him, and so now she's one of the real housewives. And first of all, she's been all over the news because apparently she beat the fuck out of her last boyfriend. <laughs> now, four straight guys, I don't mean to alienate you, but that's some funny shit. I can't help it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but every time I see a news item where there's a woman who beat her husband, I, I just laugh. I'm sorry, but I know it's wrong. It's wrong to promote violence. But when they have like those Dr. Phil's where a woman beat the fuck out of her husband, I just laugh. I laugh every time. I feel that a woman should be able to throw a vase at her husband once or twice a year. I'm sorry. It's, I, I don't mean to get political on your ass, because you know, normally I don't do the political comedy, but that's my political statement. So anyway, there's this Kelly on The Real Housewives, and the most famous scene is she, she met with Bethany, who I like, I actually like Bethany, and so they had this conversation that was like out of the blue where she said, and by the way, how Kelly, being such a New Yorker, has this weird like 14 year old girl from the valley in California accent, I don't get it, but she's met with this girl Bethany that she doesn't like, and she kept saying, you know what, you and I are like never going to be friends, okay, Bethany, because I'm sorry, but like, I'm up here, and you're down here, okay, me, like, up here, you, like, down here, she talks like she's on fucking South Park, and she's always <laughs> frenetically, like, moving her hair, and she just is a nutbag, but that whole conversation of I'm up here and you're down here is just classic, and she's got that weird accent, and uh, so on the reunion she was trying to explain how she didn't beat the fuck out of the boyfriend, but she certainly could, which of course brings me to your homegirls. Yeah. Can you handle it? All right, now let me ask you this. Do you guys get how crazy they are? Okay, phew, woo, <laughs> that's all I needed to know, because I do want to live. I want to live to breathe another day. All right, so the Housewives of New Jersey has gone to a level. What happened? Somebody's got a gun? Are you okay? <laughs> Shoot her. All right. So the Housewives of Jersey starts and, you know, I'm loving every minute of it. And I honestly thought it was going to be a sweet and innocent series about a nice mafia family and how they injure and maim each other. Oh, no. It turns out there's one chick on there who's like the ones, the fucking ones in the mafia are scared of her. All right. So first of all, um... <clears throat> Everything's in cash with you people. Nobody writes a fucking check here. The whole goddamn state, anybody? Taxes, maybe? The characters on this show are so over the top. First of all, it's all about the boobies. How are the boobies? My boobies too big, boobies too little, boobies too big, boobies, boobies. I don't know how many B's are in the word boobies, but there's at least seven that I've counted. Boobies, it's all about the boobies. Then, there's the one woman who doesn't have the boobies, but she's got an ass, and her husband, who she calls Juicy. <laughs> Luckily, he's an ass man, and he doesn't care about the boobies, FYI. All right, so they show Juicy. I don't know if that's his baptismal name. I don't know. <laughs> but I know him as Juicy. And he is so roided out of his fucking gourd that his nuts are this big, his dick is this big, and now I know why he's called Juicy, because he is shooting himself up with juice on a daily basis. Hello, Juicy. All right. And pays, oh, by the way, do you like how on that show, are you guys all in construction? Is that? The whole fucking state's in construction? There's no other vocation? Nobody's a flight attendant? Everybody's in construction? All right, so... The buying, the house is fucking beyond Persian conversion. The house with the black onyx, that house is shitting black onyx. And then the one with the boobies is there, and she's got the Kangol hat, and of course the scrunchy hair that she uses frizzies on. I know that drill. And Juicy is there paying for everything in cash. But I mean hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's always with this. Right? With the lick of the thumb. And then, is it customary for you guys to pay your general contractor with cash and then say happy birthday? 
So it's like $70,000 in cash. Happy birthday. I, is there a warranty here? Is there any paper trail at all? <laughs> Vinny? Tony? All right, so... And all the women on that show, I, I, it's hilarious. They all look like fucking linebackers, all right? Come on. No, no, admit it. The one chick with the short red hair, you know in the opening sequence when the, the, the cocktail dress is on? You cannot buy a waist on that show. They are all straight up and down. They, they scrimmage, they got shoulder pads, they have numbers. They're quite a team. And the one, the one without the boobies, who's got the two kids that are going to become models. Let's cut the shit, shall we? That's right, she got the three kids. These are not attractive children. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jersey, either you can take it or not. But the names kill me. First of all, one of them is named Gia. Now you know, this is so fucked up, you know she named that kid after Gia Karanji. You know she named that, that kid after supermodel Gia Karanji, who was a cocaine addict who died of AIDS. So someday that kid's gonna go, Mommy, who am I named after? And then the other one is named Melania. Now you know it's named after her it's. She's named after her idol, Melania Trump, who of course we've discussed in detail as a very celebrated Romanian prostitute. And, um, and a homemaker, and homemaker. All right, so, so the show is going along, and like I said, we think it's just gonna be about these women, and then there's kind of all related, but then it turns out we were wrong, weren't we? Turns out the whole show is about a dude named Danielle. That's right. There's a dude on this show named Danielle that has an entirely different identity altogether. And by the way, leave it to the geniuses at Bravo to not even do a fucking Google search. And apparently her real name is like Beverly Merrill or something. And I mean, this is hardcore. There's a mug shot and it's on Gawker and Defamer and Smoking Gun. And this week's episode was a pisser <laughs> where Danielle, as we're calling her now, um, sits down with one of the other dudes after a practice and um, <laughs> who had just left the 20 yard line. And, and then she's trying to explain her past, and it was priceless, because the two of them are having a glass of champagne, and Danielle is talking about her past like it's nothing. And did you notice that the more she told her crazy bullshit story, the more the Jersey accent came out? All right, first of all, um, how many Gs are at the end of the word along? So I'm walking along. <laughs> I need to be where I belong. <laughs> I peed myself a little bit, even at home. Just at home, I was like, ah, I'm scared. scared. Um, I turned on my security system at home, just for fun. All right, so here's the deal. When you're busted, you're busted, okay? Your mugshot is all over the news, all over the internet, and you just gotta own it, okay? When you've been busted for being a dancer <laughs> in Las Vegas, where all dancers come from. By the way, I feel bad for strippers. I feel like they can't get a fucking break. Like, it's so shameful to be a stripper. Can't you just say stripper? No, nope, there's no dancers in Las Vegas. There's strippers who later on, you know, fuck you for money. But also they stretch. It's, it, come on, it's not like she's Twyla Tharp, okay? All right, so, so she's describing how when she was a dancer in Las Vegas, um, and you know, there might have been a little uh, cocaine and extortion and a little kidnapping. Now, how do you kidnap someone a little? You just take them a few blocks, you decide to lower the ransom. How do you slightly kidnap someone? So she's telling this story, and they've got the champagne, like it's fucking high tea, and her story about getting busted is so genius, because she actually said, well, I had come home from a modeling job, whore, and, um, <laughs> modeling job, I'd come home from a modeling job, and then, how about the part where she says she lived in a house that was so big it was 30 rooms? I'm thinking she was fucked up on the blow, and it was a fucking double tree, and she thought it was her house. <laughs> 30 rooms, that's an awfully even number, Danielle, or is it Beverly? So, 
But the pinnacle was when she said, so I come back from a modeling job and I come back to my house and I live in a 30 room house and you know, it's a big house and you don't always know who's in what room. I know, hold on, it falls apart even more. So I come home and I'm in the den and it turns out I didn't even know because it's a big house and you can't hear that the feds are in the rec room. What? You know how sometimes you guys, when you go home, you're not listening that well. And you don't always hear when the feds are in your rec room. What, shooting some pool? The feds were in her rec room. So she had this crazy story and she's wrongly accused. And now I guess she's in some book called Cup Without a Badge, which I'll be one of those people on eBay paying $400 for it because I got to read that fucking book. And I just hope it works out for him. I really do. Um, All right. I, um, you want to hear about meeting Spidey? Okay. All right. So I, of course, you know, I'm very bitter toward the hills and anything hills adjacent. And here's why. I'll be honest. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Because on my life on the D-list, we try. We, I performed in a fucking maximum security prison on death row. I went to Iraq. What do they do on the fucking hills? They go to lunch. You know, they split a burrito, whatever. Okay, so they're all giant stars, whatever. Okay, so sure enough, I go to this party a couple weeks ago, and I felt it was a very famous A-list party. I was really proud of myself, somehow got on the list. And what it was, was it was this big party in Malibu at this real rich guy's house named Ron Meyer. And he's the head of uh, Universal or whatever. Okay, so it was a welcome Conan O'Brien party because of him coming to L.A. So Conan was there, and all the NBC stars were there, and Gary Shandling was there, and then uh, Kate Hutt and showed up and Tina Fey was there who I love and Megan Mullally and Deborah Messing from Will and Grace and it was star 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 right so I walk in I'm feeling very confident like wow I'm really this is my crowd now I'm running with my people no um like an idiot I go by myself which and so I've got like my high heels that are like sinking into the grass and everything and I should have brought my mom I'm telling you that's the key to bring my mom and set her up like the fucking pope in a chair and she can receive people Um, and just get drunk and swear at them. That's, if I was thinking, what I would have done. But anyway, I'm looking around at all these big stars and thinking, you know what, Kathy? These are your people, okay? Maybe you have arrived. And then I see fucking Spidey. Bam! Back on the D-list. Slam dunk! Back on the D-list where I belong. And it just was a buzzkill, you know? So I looked around and I thought, I don't really know anybody here. So I um, finally found a picnic table of gays. Saved me once again. So I just found the gayest table and sat down, and I kind of made that. I was calling it the table of judgment. So um, I was just sitting there judging people, having fun. And uh, then Tina Fey joined me, and I just love her, and I just love 30 Rock. And so we were judging people, and that was really fun. All right, so we were sitting there, and um, and I was sitting there with the gays, and then this girl comes up to the table, and she said, and they all turned to her, and they said, oh, hey, congratulations. And she goes, thank you. So then a few minutes later, I turned to the gay next to me, and I said, by the way, why why, why did you guys all congratulate that girl? And he goes, oh, well, we all work for Paramount Films, the publicity department, the PR department, and, you know, Star Trek opened to a really big weekend, big, big numbers or whatever, and she was on part of the PR team. And I go, oh, I mean, you guys, you wouldn't congratulate the director or, like, the big stars? And, but that's such a Hollywood thing to, like, say congratulations and have people just say thank you. So I decided to kind of make a parlor game out of it. So I suggest you guys try this. It's really fun. But people are such assholes in Hollywood that I went to every single person at the party and I practiced it. And I said congratulations. And except Tina Fey, every single person there went, thank you. And Tina Fey goes, for what? And I was like, oh. But it was so much fun. Like, people in Hollywood are such assholes that you can go up to anyone and go, congratulations. And they all just go, thank you, and walk away. It was so great. All right, so anyway, Tina goes, did you see Heidi and Spencer? And I was like, ugh, yeah. And and then somebody else came up to me, and they're like, Heidi and Spencer are here. Are you going to do something? Are you going to fuck with me? Are you going to say something? And I was like, no, I don't, ugh. It's, kind of, I'm just sort of, it's just cringy that they're here. It sort of makes me uncomfortable, and not really. And, you know, if you guys don't know by now, I'm not, I'm not into confronting celebrities. I would rather meet them, process it, and talk shit about them later. Because <laughs> I'm an artist, and that's my process. That's right. I was raised right. Uh... So anyway, I'm sitting there at the judgment table with the gays having a blast. And then sure enough, one of them says, oh God, here comes Heidi and Spencer. And they're walking right towards you. And I was like, oh fuck, here we go. So here they come, right? These two fucking morons. And 
Ugh, they are the worst. So first of all, Heidi, who's a very cute girl, and she has a great figure and stuff, but she had these shoes on that were sneakers with heels, which I thought personified what an idiot she is, that she still doesn't know the difference, and they were bizarre, and they had like this big rubber wedge, and it reminded me, remember that old commercial where the woman would play basketball and the heels and how silly it was? So it reminded me of that, and she would never know that reference. But anyway, and then here comes Spencer, who looked like he had just finished up a date rape. He like he had just come fresh from a date rape. He had on the Menendez brother sweater tied around his neck and a nice pastel. Just wrapped up his date rape. And and they walk over and then somebody's like, here they come, here they come, here they come. So I just turn and looked up and Spencer comes up and he takes off his aviator sunglasses and he goes, hey, just want to come over and meet you because I know just like me, you're a big fame whore. I know. I got served by fucking Spencer. <laughs> served. So it left me no choice but to say, hey, by the way, congratulations. <laughs> to which he said what I want to say to you tonight. Hey, thank you. Thanks, you guys. Good night. You have been fantastic. Thanks for participating in the CDM.